Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we're going to talk about voyages, which the dictionary defines as a journey by sea, but we are going to try to take a more 360 and metaphorical and psychological take on this topic of the voyage, which can embrace anything from a vacation to a pilgrimage, maybe part of the hero's journey or any kind of opportunity to encounter something that is new and uh, different and out of one's usual lived-in context. This leads me to an opportunity to mention an opportunity for an inner adventure or voyage with the Philadelphia Association of Jungian Analysts and its seminar, which represents an opportunity to study Jung's theories and teaching in more depth and we will put the um, contact information in the show notes for anyone who is interested. The seminar takes place in Philadelphia. It meets uh, eight weekends per year, once per month each in September, October, November, December, and then February, March, April, May. It's a Friday afternoon and all day Saturday. So it is very doable for someone who's coming in from out of town. It's an opportunity to uh, study Jung's theories more deeply. It's for people who have a serious interest in this, but you don't necessarily have to be a clinician, although about half of the group usually is. And uh, there is an application process, and you can look at our current syllabus, which begins in September. You can see that online too. Our website is cgyoungphiladelphia.org. And if you click on seminar, you'll see all the information there. The seminar is always taught by a uh, different Jungian analyst, including the three of us. So if you're you know, within shooting distance of the eastern seaboard of the United States and you have a serious interest in Jung, and this sounds like an opportunity you might be interested in, uh, please do take a look. So let's shift to voyages. Well, of course, uh, as the two of you know, and some of our Patreon supporters also know, um, I have just been on a voyage, a trip to the island of Crete which is today part of Greece, although it was once its own culture. And I was there for two weeks on a tour that was dedicated to the search for goddess images and goddess history in the ancient Minoan culture. So I've been down in caves and up on mountains and at archaeological sites and museums. And I'm now in the process of thinking about what this voyage meant to me when I started out on it and what it means to me now that I have so many experiences to digest. What that brings up for me, Deb, is the process that we go through to create meaning that as I imagine you going to these sacred sites in Crete and um, becoming enriched about the Minoan culture, there's the experience you're having in the moment and then upon reflection, the meaning that you weave into the experiences and also how you weave that into your sense of self and perhaps even into the larger arc of one's life. What I uh, have become aware of is how close to the earth people back then lived in the Minoan culture of building palaces like Knossos and we saw Phaistos and Malia and Gornia and how close to the earth and its generativity those people were. And I was aware very much of you know, how distanced I often am from that. We don't grow our own crops. We don't have to go to the well or a stream to get water. And that spirit of, of being so close to and living in the matrix of generativity that the earth provides Uh, was truly striking for me. And it's there today as well. I don't know how many million olive trees there are on Crete, but I would say easily 
maybe 50 million. On the island of Lesbos, which is smaller, there are 9 million. Something here still about the dedication to the earth's fertility and planting these trees that are so abundant uh, with their crop of olives on every possible available surface. So it put me in touch with a source of life in a felt, lived way that I don't usually feel even when I'm taking a walk on Cape Cod to the ocean of what it's like to live so close to the earth and its generative potential. And that one's needs would have been met from your engagement with the earth and with nature directly. Yes. And there's a way in which we through supermarkets and processing food. I mean, there's a way that a child could grow up in our culture and think that, you know, hamburger comes from, you know, the supermarket and and perhaps be dramatically um, separated from where that actually happens. This was also a culture that venerated the feminine spirit uh, in very concrete ways of many uh, pottery images of the goddess, sometimes holding snakes, uh, which are not poisonous on Crete, in all kinds of poses, dressed but bare-breasted, frescoes, jewelry, uh, very advanced technology, which took place in a civilization that uh, started generating all of these things as much as 3,500 years before B.C., Uh, before the common era, of the creative potential and the honoring of of both masculine and feminine spirit. So there's a way that traveling can, or going on a voyage, can um, help us connect with something that feels perhaps very different, but also very universal? There's a sense of recognition Uh, something very ancient, uh, I think, for all of us on the trip uh, that we have not directly experienced, and yet we recognize and take in at a different level. So that brings up, as we lift this into a larger category, the idea of where does the energy come from and what is the incepting fantasy that somebody carries that either launches them into a voyage or a vacation, or a pilgrimage, or a life journey. But some kind of seed has to wake us up to mobilize, and mobilize our resources for that matter, to make this happen. Well, I think you're asking a question, Joseph, that puts me right into a potential, I don't know if it's exactly a shadow side of travel. Travel is very popular, and it's, you know, it has some cachet to it. There's some status associated with being able to travel. It can take on a kind of acquisitive sort of form to it that each place we travel to is sort of another notch on our belt. And we go and we, you know, crane our necks at the Sistine Chapel and we kind of check that off. And perhaps if we travel in that way, it doesn't really affect us deeply, that it winds up being a kind of persona exercise, essentially. We're kind of consuming sensory experiences when it's entered into at that level. Yes. And wanting to travel in in that way can be a desire for escape, a desire for the bragging rights when you come home and say, well, I was just in Rome (laughs) or whatever it is. The idea of status. And I think that's part of the ancient world as well. I think in, in more ancient cultures, people may have never traveled more than four or five miles away from their homes. So the incredible privilege it is in a modern, particularly American culture, to be able to travel even across the United States, let alone travel to other countries, that it is miraculous that we can do that. And at the same time, for Americans, kind of ubiquitous. Our sense of time uh, has really collapsed. And I was very aware of that on my voyage to Crete, of that every piece of pottery Uh, every fresco, every building block for the Knossos Palace, for example, or even a house had to be hewn and transported and lifted and set in place uh, versus our 
high-speed culture where we take airplanes, we go on the internet, we use a microwave. The pace of life was much, much slower and put me more in touch with an, an inner place of slowing down, reflection, taking things in uh, more deeply, which I think might be very different in a kind of slow-mo voyage and quasi-pilgrimage than it is if you're really just checking off the, the list of, you know, this morning the Sistine Chapel and then the Colosseum and then uh, something else. So it's a question of what you want, what you're looking for, and what is meaningful to any traveler. There isn't a right or wrong about this. Oh, and by the way, I'm a big fan of both the Sistine Chapel and the Colosseum here, so we're not <laughs> trying to, to knock Rome in any way. <laughs> but we're returning to this idea about what is it in the, in the human soul or a particular soul that generates the energy to, to take the adventure? So we were starting, I think, with your comment, Deb, to talk about the idea of the pilgrimage and that if I imagine the phenomena of a pilgrimage, that there's a search that's growing in the individual to encounter the sacred. And then they're beginning to kind of cast the imagination out into the world to see where their imagination lands and carries this fantasy that if I could arrive at Jerusalem, uh, at Mecca, at Canterbury, that something would happen both in the movement towards the location and in the arrival itself. So sometimes the journey can involve this desire to encounter the numinous. Yeah, and I think it often does, whether or not we recognize that that's what we're going for or not. There's a way that even the casual traveler starting off expects to be awed somehow, expects to encounter something that will really capture his or her imagination. Even if we're just headed to Vegas for the weekend, in a way, that's what we're looking for. It's something we might not think about it that way, but some encounter with a numinous force. Yes, we want to be infused with something from the outer world. It will connect with something in our inner world. And we may not even really be able to define what it is, but... I think I'm building on your point, Joseph, that it, in a pilgrimage, it is a search for the sacred. But I think even on a vacation, we are looking for that special something that we hope will come toward us, will meet us if we go to meet it. We're talking about the way in which we can all be affected when we're on a journey, that all of us take on the archetype of the stranger. And when we're wearing the garb of the stranger and whether we're going to Vegas or whether we're going to Jerusalem, that there's something about the readiness to be affected by what's happening. But I really do think that what we're looking for shapes the journey. So I would be shy about collapsing the impulse for a vacation and the impulse for a pilgrimage. I don't know that I would want to bring that into one place. I've had some friends that have gone through great lengths to walk the uh, Camino de Santiago, and that was a different feeling than wanting to go down to Key West. I mean, they really entered into it differently. They thought about it differently. And, and it begs the question of, did they create something different in that walk because they were searching for something numinous? Well, and, and it's almost to, to, there's sort of a continuum, right? Because we can go and search consciously, perhaps of the numinous, or we can go to Key West in search of a break and perhaps an escape. I imagine that this sort of search for the numinous and search for the escape, there, there may be overlapping territory there at times. There may be. I think that when I imagine vacations, I, I definitely think about the drive for renewal, that people are tired, people are fatigued even by the repetition of their lives, and they're looking for newness and some kind of enlivening. But the enlivening could be sensuous and even shadowy. I mean, that whole thing about you know what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So a vacation could be an opportunity to eat unrestrainedly or to have sex unrestrainedly or experiment in different ways or sleep as long as you want to. So the vacation 
from the superego, the vacation from the rigors and limits of our day-to-day life. And the promise of that is highly motivating for sure. So it, it's the promise of indulgence on a vacation of pleasure, of escape from the daily life. And I'm, I'm contrasting it with the idea of the pilgrimage that always involves some real work. The people who take the walk on the Camino uh, hike for many, many miles. It goes all the way from France down to Spain, and pe- people select uh, where they want to start, but they don't always do the entire thing. And then there's the Canterbury Tales, where, again, you have to set out on what is an arduous journey in order to reach the center, uh, whether it's Canterbury or Jerusalem. and internally, some place that's being sought inside the self. I really resonate with the idea, Deb, that often in a pilgrimage, there's an expectation or even an insistence on some form of purification through suffering, whether it's walking across the plaza towards the cathedral on one's knees, but that something about the rigor of the journey to Canterbury would prepare one and purify one so that the arrival to the numinous can be felt and received. Perhaps what all of these images have in common is a desire to be taken out of our daily life and in some way changed, whether we're renewed and able to go back to the daily grind, or a deeper kind of transformation that we're hoping to undergo. I'm interested in the way that travel, if it's not pursued in a kind of overly persona identified way can actually result in a significant perspectival shift that kind of knocks us out of our stuck story about ourselves and helps us to see our lives with a different perspective. And there's actually research on this. For me, I find that traveling alone is more likely to bring that shift than traveling even you know, with anyone. I mean, I, there's something about being somewhere alone that really frees you up to experience something in a way where you can just drop your persona rather than you know needing to feel like you have to comment on it or um, <laughs> check in with someone about, are you ready to go to the next spot? And that it can affect me more deeply when I'm alone. And I remember traveling in my 20s several times, and they were, they were vacations, they were short, and the purpose was, to, you know, to uh, take a break and, and renew. But I do remember that each time I returned home, it was like I had a clearer view of what was going on with my life. And I knew that I needed to make some changes. Sometimes they were small changes, sometimes they were big changes, but I was very aware that getting out of my life, stepping out of the stream of my life, even just for a week, would allow me to take stock in a different way. So travel can provide a different lens on our lives. And there's a a wonderful uh, quote from uh, uh, Miguel de Unamuno when he says that travel cures racism. And there's a way in which being exposed to different cultures breaks the fantasy that everybody is like me, or that everybody needs to be like me. And it widens our view of what humanity is in general. I think ideally it does. that. I don't know that it's a guarantee. No, I don't know that it's a guarantee either, but it's certainly a hope. I mean, one of the things about travel is, uh, you know, in preparation for this episode, I went back to Memories, Dreams, Reflections, and there's a whole section in there called Travels, in which Jung describes his travels. And in the first part, he's describing his travels to Tunisia, and he says that he sees the men holding hands. And so he learned that homosexuality was rampant in Tunisia. And I was thinking, hmm, (laughs) I'm not sure he was really interpreting that correctly. And what came up for me was the way that travel invites our projections. We go to a new place, we see new things, we smell new things, we hear new things, uh, we're sort of overwhelmed by it all. And and by the way, this might be just, you know, a, a drive five hours away to a different state in the U.S. that can be like that or or a journey overseas. And what we tend to do when we meet something that we don't know what it is, is we immediately project on it. 
And so in this way, travel can be a way of meeting new aspects of ourselves because that's what we're doing when we're projecting is we're projecting some as yet unknown content from our own unconscious out onto the world around us. So it can be this wonderful, rich opportunity to encounter something new in ourselves. And I'm thinking about uh, what we do is what we have is our own internal cultural context and meanings. To take your example of Jung in Tunisia, you know, that was uh, his context, his cultural context, that men holding hands must mean that they are homosexual. So I'm thinking that although we do that because we have to use what we have, the next step might also be to be curious about, wow, this is the meaning that I made of this, whatever the this is. But is that the way the people here uh, see this? Or is it simply a sign of affection or, or something else in that culture? And I'm building on your point, Joseph, too, about being the stranger of the, the I don't knows that could or should come up when traveling. Gee, I don't know what this means. I've never done anything like that. I don't know about this. And then how do we encounter what is strange to us and how are we received as strangers? Well, and we're also invited, I think when we are the stranger, we're invited to see ourselves anew as well. You know, Carlos Castaneda said something like, if you want to go, if you want to learn who you are, go somewhere where no one knows you. Because you're, and that that may be part of my experience of traveling alone, being more deeply transformational, is there's no one around you who's going to kind of mirror back your persona that the other person is used to. And, And so being a stranger can be an enormously renewing experience. Yes, and we are the ones who are different. We are in an altogether different culture. Uh, It really almost means that we must acclimate and adjust to the differences in that culture around cuisine, uh, manners, and other cultural norms. It invites us and kind of makes us uh, be more flexible. Yeah, it challenges us that way. Mm Mm-hmm challenges a lot of our assumptions about what's real and how we live. I want to bring up a slightly different thing that can happen to me. We're talking a lot about the positive stuff, but I'm, I, there can be negative things about travel too, because it can be a kind of escapism. It can be used for escapism and a way to sort of avoid what is. And, and uh, I'll just share a personal anecdote that um, when I was younger, I spent some time uh, living overseas for a couple of years. And although I, I guess I guess that was a voyage, it was an extended voyage. And what I noticed is when I had a sort of ordinary bad day, like something went wrong at work or got into a fight with a friend or just something like that, my train of thought would inevitably go to fantasies of returning home. And, you know, sort of like, well, you know, heck, I'm just going to get out of here. And when I recognized that I was doing this, I got really curious about it because I thought to myself, (laughs) and what if I'm home and I have a bad day? What's my fantasy then? And I, I realized that I was living somewhat in a state of sort of suspended animation. You know, there was a way I was sort of avoiding something, avoiding kind of what is. I could always kind of keep afloat this fantasy that there was this way to escape by just kind of moving on to the next place. I don't know that it it altered much, but it was an interesting underlying pattern. It felt so temporary that there's a way that it didn't feel like I had to deal with anything unpleasant because I was in this state of journeying. That reminds me of the time that I went to India uh, 20 years ago and was confronted with some scenes of poverty and physical limitation and debilitation that were were shocking and made me feel helpless and at times horrified, filled with pity and compassion. And how difficult those feelings were to confront and to be forced to confront in myself. 
the trip to Crete was the polar opposite. Uh, uh, the culture there is very generous. People reach out with gifts. I was given a bookmark. I was given a small bottle of the local uh, liquor called Rahaki. I was given a bar of soap. And that's certainly a very lovely and wonderful experience to have and has left me with a huge appreciation for the spirit of generosity and welcome. But we do encounter the shadow side in ourselves as well when we travel. And particularly in cultures where what we consider shadow might be considered a, a norm in the society. You know, for instance, if we come from an American culture that's particularly repressive, where people are expected to perhaps not be very passionate in their communications or to be very reserved, and then you go to a, a really lively area of Spain and people are are very expressive physically and verbally and emotionally. And uh, that can be really shocking and liberating to somebody who doesn't come from that culture because it seems like the culture is transgressing, you know, what's normal for us. Um, I think in the early 20th century, when people were going visiting indigenous tribes where very little clothing was worn and uh, Europeans were showing up, you know, in corsets, uh, that just seemed absolutely shocking that people wouldn't uh, have invented corsets, you know, <laughs> in the Polynesian islands. Um, but but in that moment, in that encounter, people have to somehow know about a whole other way of living, and and figure out what their relationship is going to mm -hmm. be. And sometimes the relationship, as we saw with the great colonial efforts, is to repress it, to make it obey the conqueror's level of comfort versus coming in a little bit more like a, an anthropologist and learning from the culture and perhaps experimenting with what is it like to take on the values or experiences of different people and how that might enlarge us. I think what uh, you're talking about is how do we manage to hold in ourselves differences between us and another culture. What do we do when we are confronted with a difference that really matters, a difference that jolts us, a difference that may be very much at odds with what we consider right or normal or proper? Do we try to make the other people conform? Do we withdraw in uh, judgment? Uh, what do we do with those differences? that confront us with our own strongly held beliefs. And that is in the realm of shadow and what is repressed in us, but not, might not be repressed in a different culture. Um, and that's an area of tremendous growth, I think. And as Lisa, you were saying, the idea of whether we're projecting idealizations on another culture or shadow or any number of things, if we go in with that psychological lens, then it becomes this very intense, confrontation of our own psyche and our own unconscious minds. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned idealization because I think, you know, obviously that that is something that can happen frequently. And, you know, I think it depends on what, what do we do with these experiences when, when we come home? Uh, do we, do we leave them there up on the shelf with our souvenirs as sort of idealizations or, or do we let it penetrate and allow these experiences to enlarge us where we can claim some of that, either what we thought was shadowy or what we idealized. We can see how that lives in us and perhaps increase our own consciousness around who we are as a result of these encounters. And I think I would like to add a sense of humility of that our way and our thoughts and our meaning-making pr process is one of, you know, millions and millions of ways of making meaning and living and having values. That that's something that I certainly uh, took from my trip to India and um, in a different way from this trip to Crete in the appreciation of the values and lifestyle as we could imagine them from what remains of this ancient civilization and a, a connection to 
a time that transpired thousands of years ago. And it has been a source of real humility of how hard people worked and what they put into their lives and the sense of community that they had. that Everyone was needed. Everyone was valued. Uh, from the farmer to the potter to the person working in the quarry cutting stone. Uh, it all took effort and time and uh, people working as best they could to build a civilization. I also want to go back to the idea of storytelling, which we've touched on with uh, the Canterbury Tales. And I was with a group of women. The stories that we tell each other about ourselves. What do we share about ourselves? What does the other person share about in this recent trip about herself? And then the meaning that we make of it and the, you know, our own projections, that there are always stories, stories, stories everywhere on, on every journey, I think. And I was certainly enriched by the stories that I was told by my fellow travelers. Um, they weren't as, as raucous and as much filled with satire as what I remember of the Canterbury Tales. But that shared meaning-making process and where and how and with whom people want to make connection is also very much part of a voyage. Well, and when we return from a voyage, that's what we really have, right? We really have stories. We have stories. But I am thinking about the idea of the companion and how in mythology, uh, often the hero will need to find a companion or to be inspired by a companion in order to enter into the voyage uh, fully and even safely. So there's the, the social warmth of having a companion to process the experience. But there is something inside of us that sometimes needs a companion in order to tolerate the intensity of the voyage. And conversely, there are some kind of journeys that have to be taken alone. And whether that's a life transition that is fundamentally rests only on your shoulders or some other kind of uh, a pilgrimage that is a declaration of your autonomy. And I think um, for myself several years ago, I decided that I would uh, take a 10-day vacation in Europe totally alone and not bring any companions and to experience myself without relying on another person to comfort me or to process the experience, but to only be talking to myself about what's happening and also only be responding to myself in terms of what initiates me to move towards something that's interesting or away from something that perhaps isn't. And, th and that was a tremendous 10 days of self-exploration and self-definition. Yeah, I think it, it becomes a very different experience. Really, any kind of travel alone feels very different than doing it with a friend or a, or a group because you're dropped into your own inner world, really, and, and confronting whatever it is you're there to see from that standpoint rather than uh, from the standpoint of the social persona. Although I would add that the, com the physical companions, whether on a journey or perhaps one's own inner companion that you had or discovered on your trip to solitary trip to Europe of who and what does companion us and uh, how are we enriched by what we get in touch with, whether it's mostly an internal source of enlivenment and growth or whether it's externally in social connection with others. So I'm thinking about on a solitary journey or on my solitary journey, as an extrovert, it's easy for me to project the inner companion onto other people. But by having a kind of self-imposed isolation and in a country where I did not speak the language, that something inside me had to constellate as an inner companion, which normally would have been more difficult for me to access as an extrovert. And it was difficult in the first few days, but as the week went on, uh, I really came to treasure it. How about um, the idea of the life journey and that the voyage or the journey can also help us organize substantial life transitions? I think about um, the work that 
you're doing and continue to do, Lisa, on motherhood as a kind of voyage, as a journey that really has a beginning and transforms a woman as she continues on this voyage. And even once the children are launched, that she is different having taken that journey. Yes. I mean, again, this goes back maybe to what we were saying before about travels, which is we're seeking to be changed in some way. And I think that that is perhaps why life experiences such as motherhood can often get spoken about in the metaphorical terms of a journey, because we recognize that we depart from some known place, go to some unknown place, and are forever changed as a result. And that is certainly true of motherhood as it is for many life experiences, you know. And, and I think in, in some way, Joseph, we're, we're sort of stretching into the hero's journey territory, which was outlined by the mythologist Joseph Campbell, who was very much influenced by Jung. And he noted that there were these uh, kind of predictable paths that hero stories t- took. He researched mythologies from around the world and noticed these things that they had in common. And often in mythology, the hero's journey is an actual journey where he, hero, goes and does something and has an encounter with helpful energies and uh, a confrontation with a dragon. And, And then there has to be a return to the community. I'm thinking about uh, the mythology that I read uh, prior to going on this trip to Crete, of reviewing in particular the story of King Minos on Crete and the hero Theseus, who volunteered in some tales to go over and be part of the sacrifice to the monster, the Minotaur, and then did, in fact, of course, kill the Minotaur and have his journey home. Uh, and back to the community, and that how much these voyages or journeys challenge us. In this myth, uh, Theseus had to meet the monster that was half human and had the head of a bull and devoured people. What was my hero's journey, whether it was my own motherhood or this particular trip? What did I go out to seek? Did I find it? And now, of course, I'm back on Cape Cod and I have returned. And it will be a while for me to be making meaning of it. I should state for the record that I did not encounter any dragons. Or or minotaurs. (laughs) Or minotaurs. (laughs) One of the things that, that this part of the conversation constellates me is the way home can feel different at the end of the journey. And sometimes that can even give us a sense of how much we have been changed. When I think of uh, the Lord of the Rings, you know, and after the hobbits all come back to the Shire, and there's this moment uh, in the movie and the book where they realize that what it means to be in the Shire no longer holds the same comfort or the same level of familiarity because they have become unfamiliar to the paradigm that they left and, and how are they going to metabolize that? I think about veterans who come home from Afghanistan or, or a long time ago, the Vietnam War, coming back to what they thought would feel like home, and yet they are so changed, even painfully so, that what they fantasized home would be like can no longer hold the same nostalgic or familiar values. So some journeys change us profoundly. Yes. And, and there is a question of, can we hold both? Can we hold uh, the connection with our home as it was before and, and, and still be able to retain this way that in which you know, we were transformed? Or, or can home no longer be home? I mean, I think for many veterans, it was true that home could no longer be home. Joseph, you brought up the Lord of the Rings, and I was going to bring that up too, because uh, that is a journey. <laughs> I don't know if you recall, but I, I believe the last two words of the whole trilogy are, I'm back. Sam has uh, t- gone to the Grey Havens to see off Bilbo and Sam uh, and Frodo and Gandalf, and then he comes back to his wife and his children, 
And he sets his pack down and inside the front door and says, I'm back. And I always found that in ending kind of a little bit uh, like cryptic and unsatisfying. Uh, and, and, and then uh, when I returned from my journey of analytic training, we travel twice a year during analytic training. So it was also a physical journey as well as a deeply psychological one. The time that I that I graduated, I had finished my exams and successfully passed them and then went through the ceremony of graduation, which for me was very meaningful. And then I felt very emotional and, you know, hadn't slept well and all the rest of it. And then arrived back at my home and was greeted by my family. And I thought, oh, now I know how Sam feels because I was forever changed, and yet I could still be home. And Sam is a unique character, I think, in Lord of the Rings, because um, he seems to hold on to those kind of warm, familial ways of relating, and and a longing to return to his garden, and to get married, and, and to have children. Yeah, Sam really encompasses the opposites in that way. Yes, he really does. And some of the other characters, I think, even from the beginning, didn't seem to hold those same fantasies or that value system, that they seemed more willing to be affected and divorced from perhaps the cultural norms that they had left behind, longing to be free of it. And I've certainly had friends come back from a trip and then decide that they are no longer going to call this home, that they will continue to have a life uh, where they move frequently or take a job for instance, like a traveling nurse, and to enjoy the fact that every couple of months they are reconfiguring a place to stay and feeling that all of that change is much more authentic for them than actually to sit and build a single relationship with an area. I was very much ready to come home uh, after this almost, well, three weeks away. And to be back here, and I'm thinking about you, I'm back in the Shire, and how dear it is, the familiar landscape and the beach, the Atlantic, going grocery shopping, a, a new appreciation of and gratitude. And I think that's when when uh, they get back to the Shire, I think there is that that new level of, of love for this, you know, the the Shire for home versus people who do decide that this home that I came from no longer fits me and I, I need to be somewhere else. So one of the things that we can say about voyages is they alter our relationship with home. They make it clearer what that relationship is. Uh, they may make it so that we appreciate it more and feel more grateful for home, or we decide that it isn't home after all, and it's time to leave. And when we claim that something is home, what we're saying is that we project a certain kind of complex and an archetype upon the environment, that that structure of homeness or hominess is something that we actually generate and invest in an environment, and, and that that internal relationship can change. Hi, this is Lisa from This Union Life Podcast. Joseph, Deb, and I have been deeply moved by your responses to our work. Producing, editing, and distributing the podcast involves substantial expenses, and we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisunionlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month, and at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Thank you. So I wonder if this would be a good place to switch to a dream. Sounds good. 
So our dreamer today is a 63 year old man who is a social worker. And here's the dream. He says, this is a dream from 15 years ago. I am leading a group of men walking up a cobblestone road in a village high up in the Himalayas. I have a wooden staff and I'm walking quickly. A panicked man runs toward us saying, they have the children. We start to run toward a large wooden building with a stone roof. The only access is a wooden staircase. I climb the staircase that leads to an open room with children pinned in fear against the walls. In the center of the room is a demon with a highly muscular body covered in fine red hair and a pig slash human head. There are many more in the room. It ignores us and is about to rape a young naked boy who is bent over in front of it. My fear turns to white anger and my staff turns into a sword, which I lift up to my right ear with both hands. The demon turns to me just as I cut its head off. A pitched battle starts between my men and the demons. We initially succeed, but the demons start to conquer. My last thought is calm and peaceful. Today I die, but what a way to die. And we hear of the context, the dreamer says, this was a small part of a very challenging spiritual crisis. I really didn't want to be on, but thankfully it led to Jung through much synchronicity. And as for the feelings in the dream, fear, responsibility, and honor. And he notes that it was like being in a movie. It was so real. So talk about a hero's journey, huh? This monster uh, whose head gets cut off like Theseus does with the Minotaur. Just as a note, this dreamer says that he had the dream 15 years ago. So this is one of those really powerful dreams that can haunt somebody because of the intensity of the images and feelings. And it's still alive in him, uh, or he wouldn't have sent us, sent it into us. Uh, that there's still meaning and something that's important today, 15 years later. And that can certainly happen with big dreams like this, uh, that they can tell us more and more as time goes by. Yeah, and sometimes we can't understand them until years later. So I'm uh, aware that um, he's walking with a group of men. So they're, So it's all men in the beginning, at least. And it's in a village high up in the Himalayas. And I, I can tell you that, you know, my impression is that this is not someone who lives in, in, the, Him, in the Himalayas, just judging by uh, the dreamer's email address. So if we had this dreamer here, I would be very curious about whether or not he had ever visited the Himalayas or what significance that er area of the world had for him if he had any associations to the Himalayas, but we might have to make do with our own imaginations about that since we don't have the dreamer. Well, I think for many people who haven't been to the Himalayas, that it's, it holds a, a projection of spirituality, that there's great um, stories. T. Lobseng Rampa wrote these wonderful spiritual melodramas about, you know, the Tibetan masters and Tibetan spirituality and great mystical powers. So um, I'd like to just make a, an assumption without actually having the, the man here with us that, you know, he, he believes in the beginning of the dream that he and other men, the other men inside of him are taking what they think of as a spiritual journey. And that the ego feels that it is really leading the process uh, and that the staff is a, a, a tool of power for him in as much as it can also become a sword. So if I looked at the dream in very broad themes and don't get overly triggered by the specific scenario in it, and we think about it as truly symbolic, there's a tension between the spirituality of hiking in the Himalayas and the demon of sexuality that shows up in the dream that then seems to be encountering the inner child inside of him. For this person, I would imagine 
that sexuality and spirituality are considered at very opposite poles of the spectrum, and that at the center of the spirituality is the archetype of innocence and the idea of the innocent child that should not be touched by the demonic sexuality inside of the psyche. And that's a very old theme in the world. Yes, this demon has a pig's head. So this, you know, there is something about carnality and lust and really being sort of of the earth, kind of earthiness that you're right, Joseph, it is in opposition to the projection that many Westerners have on the Himalayas. You know, you're, you're literally, when you're in the Himalayas, you're up very high <laughs> physically. And somehow that this seems from the perspective of the, of the ego, in any case, this demon seems to pose a real threat to this innocent childlike part of the psyche. And if one is taking a true spiritual journey, uh, particularly in terms of masculine psychology, at some point, uh, a man has to be in relationship to the raw and most instinctive part of his sexuality, and that that can't be divorced from his spiritual process as well. It may have to be shaped or even subdued in a certain way so that it serves the sexual and spiritual combination. But when it's cut off, when the sexuality is banished into the, the nether regions, the Hades of the psyche, it tends to become more primitive uh, and more problematic. Yes, and to gain energy. So in a way, it's a really good thing that this dreamer confronts the demon. You know, he, he wants to cut it off, right? He, cut off, he cuts off its head, but that's not actually kind of where it, where it lands. But the fact that he is able, that the, the ego is, is willing to kind of take a stand, kind of to confront this complex, is promising, I think. And is not that very much a part of the hero's journey of having the, as Jung says, the encounter with the dragon, which can take, in this case, the shape of a demon, and that the ego does have to defeat and attain dominion over these really raw, instinctual compulsions? Compulsions are just instincts. You know, depending on how somebody is raised, they can come to believe that their sexuality, uh, a man can come to believe that his erection is somehow evil and awful and dangerous and can't be allowed to exist comfortably inside of him. There's an interesting moment at the end where he says, as the battle starts between the men and the demons, because there's a lot of demons, and all of these men are struggling with this very instinctive level his last thought of the dream ego is, today I will die. But what a way to die. I have to tell you, that's a phrase people often will use when they're in a kind of ecstatic libidinous process. You know, somebody has the best sex of their life. They're like, what a way to die. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that it's a very ambivalent sentence at the end. I think one of the one of the ways I read it, it's a death of the a conventional ego stance. Right. It's a the death of the ego attitude that has existed up until now. And it's very, I think, prognostically positive that the dreamer feels calm about it. It's like the dream ego knows that it needs to die and it's not fighting it. And what we think of with the death of the ego is that there's a transformation of the personality underway. I mean, in a sense, it's like the demons are going to prevail. And so what we might imagine, I mean, obviously I'm just making this up because we don't really know this dreamer, is that these instincts are going to live in this dreamer's life in a new, perhaps revived way. And of course, you know, hopefully not channeled toward what's actually pictured in the dream, right? But the, but the instincts of sexuality, or even it more broadly, generativity, are important and life-giving. Absolutely. And, and this is an opportunity for us to really talk to the listeners and say that um, the unconscious is amoral, that the unconscious will harvest any kind of imagery, any kind of scenario that's necessary to communicate a kind of emotional impact and to demonstrate 
a kind of symbolic movement that although this dream to the listeners may sound very shocking, and of course it is, if we were to think of it as an actual event in the world, but if we can lift to an exclusively symbolic level that these images represent psychological forces, that gives both the dreamer and the analyst the space to turn this into psychologically valuable processes. And this is a wonderfully challenging example of that exactly. You know, one more thing about this image of the staff being turned into a sword, and I think, Joseph, this is picking up a little bit on what you were saying, is that the sword can be an image of the the faculty of discernment that sort of distinguishes between one thing and another. And that is what's needed in the conscious attitude when dealing with an instinct, because there are helpful parts of the instinct, and there are parts of the instinct that you probably (laughs) need to say, we're not going to act on that. And that there are the two different phallic images of the young boy who's about to be raped and the phallic energy of the sword, uh, a sword of judgment, a sword of discrimination, a sword that is much less instinctual. Swords are made by men. They're hammered into shape. So it's an image that is already uh, more conscious and more evolved uh, than simply the instinctual energy of the phallus. I'd like to offer a hermetic lens on this, so I'm going to be pulling in a kind of obscure piece of information. But in the tarot key number nine, which is called the hermit, in most tarot decks, which are thought to be archetypal images, there is the top of a mountain, and then there is a a man standing at the top, the Ancient of Days, holding a staff in the left hand, often holding a lantern, showing light to those below them. In one uh, mystery school tradition, the staff is a metaphor for the harnessing of sexual energies in the psycho-spiritual development of the individual. In the East, they talk about this as kundalini or tantra, in that when one is ascending the mountain, one is holding the staff and using it to balance or using it to pull one upward and upward. When the staff is in use, the hermetic teaching is that the sexual forces are being vigorously lifted up through the spine to higher psycho-spiritual uses, and that once the mountaintop is attained, those processes become quiescent and something else, the emergence of the self, actually happens. So here, the staff is in hand. He's walking up the mountain, which suggests in that tradition that the sexual forces and the harnessing of the sexual forces is the essential engine that will finally get him to the top of the mountain if it can be harnessed to these higher levels, these higher concerns. So the encounter with the sexual demon, the pig demon, has to happen. And those forces would have to be sublimated one way or another in order for him to continue on his journey. Yeah, that's really that's really very interesting. I think that my intuition is that does capture something perhaps that was being pictured in this dream. I, I am curious, since this is a dream that this dreamer had 15 years ago, of how and that it still carries mystery and importance in this person's psyche. If something has still not really been resolved or understood or connected with. Uh, and I don't know what that might be, but I kind of maybe pose this question to, to the dreamer of what is still calling you in this dream 15 years later? And that's a good question, Deb. It's a big question. And where my curiosity returns to again is this collision between the most raw, instinctive sexual energy and the man's fantasy of innocence and prepubescent purity. Mm-hmm. And, and that is a collision of forces that many people who think of themselves as spiritual really do have to face. And that is unique to Christian spirituality, where sexuality and celibacy 
are often um, idealized as a form of spiritual purity. I have a kind of intuitive thought uh, that just came up that you sparked, Joseph, that for Jung, who had a a very meaningful relationship with uh, Siegfried from from Wagner and other hero stories of, of Germany, he eventually had a significant uh, vision or dream in which he killed Siegfried. And he was stricken when he awoke and stricken in the dream that he had killed this beautiful Teutonic hero and later came to realize that he needed to move on from being enthralled with the hero archetype to something else, uh, that he had to forfeit his, his dream and his love of Siegfried the hero in order to find something deeper in himself. And I'm just wondering whether that might resonate um, here with this dream and the person who sent it in. Yes, Deb, that's, that's really lovely because this dreamer is certainly in the role of the hero in this dream, and then he has to die at the end. And there's a way that we, when we are in a heroic attitude, that is often compensated by an innocence complex, which I think we see in this dream. And it's like the innocence is about to be punctured. And, and sometimes that's what we need. We need to have our innocence complex sacrificed and our heroic uh, attitude defeated so that we can enter into a process of knowing our own shadow and entering into our own depths. Mm. I think that's a great way of tying things up, Lisa. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.